thousand BC. So within two thousand years after that kind of, or I'm sorry, within two hundred years of that um, kind of, uh, you know, big collapse they had around sixty two hundred BC with the uh, you know giant floods and tsunamis and everything. Um, so they go and they spread through Italy. They spread uh, to Spain two hundred years after that. Um, and they go and they actually do in some areas, especially northwestern Italy, uh, where there were kind of dense Western hunter gatherer populations around the coast. Uh, they do mix in with them. So a lot of these kind of EEFs um, with the cardio wear culture, you know, had like 30 uh, percent Western hunter gatherer ancestry even before the um, big kind of event around 4400 B.C. Um so they go, they uh, spread around Italy. There's, you know, probably a few hundred thousand people living in the peninsula back in, um, you know, about 4,500 BC. And then in um, 4,400 BC, you have something that happens all around uh, Europe um, called the, the hunter-gatherer resurgence. And it's uncertain what happened. My guess is it had something to do with the spread of a copper metallurgy out of the Balkans. Um, could have been a plague, uh, could have been climatic shift. It's hard to say, um, but all over Europe, uh, civilization just collapsed. And in the, uh, civilizations that succeed it 200 years later, and Italy is no exception, you've seen a massive increase in the amount of Western hunter gatherer ancestry, uh, within these kind of early European farmer civilizations. Um, so, uh, you know, what it looks like happened is, for whatever reason, the agricultural, you know, mode of production that had served the EEF so well for so long, uh, basically disintegrated briefly and allowed for the hunter gatherers to, uh, you know, come out of their remote forest areas that they'd been hiding out in for the previous 1800 years and uh, overwhelm them. And so you have, um, they don't destroy them though. There is quite a bit of mixing and the uh, original kind of EEF ancestry remained, you know, majority of uh, ancestry within the settled populations of Europe, uh, pretty much everywhere. Um, now, uh, including Italy as well. Um, so that goes on. And you also have a, uh, at the same time, or within that same roughly 500 year period, between 400 or 4400 BC and 4000 BC, you have the arrival of this ancestry called the Caucasian hunter-gatherer ancestry, uh, which is more likely Iran, Iran Neolithic, Zagrosian, um, whatever you want to call it. I, those two actually, the Zagrosians and the Caucasian hunter-gatherers are actually separate. Um, you know, they're just, they appear as, depending on how you want to weigh the components, though, they can uh appear as the same thing, depending on how you want to weigh them in the uh, genetics testing. Uh, basically, it's not important where that racial component originally came from in the ancestry of the Mediterranean, but there was a, a migration out of Anatolia, um, that's the Asiatic part of Turkey, that did happen around 4000 BC. It wasn't a population replacement. Um, this group the group that transmitted it was most likely already had a lot of ancestry, similar to the EEFs uh, that had stayed back home in Anatolia, which was the original home of the EEFs. Um, you know, but this new group did spread it um, across the, uh, you know, at least the eastern part of the Mediterranean, definitely in Greece, uh, southern Italy, Sardinia, Sicily. Um, you know, not much further beyond that. It does not appear in the Balkans north of Greece. So uh, this was definitely a uh, seaborne transmission of uh, this kind of ancestry and these kind of peoples. Um, sea trade was becoming a big deal around 4000 BC. Uh, we do see the start of the amber trade, um, which connects uh, stuff all the way from um, the Baltic to, you know, the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, you know, we see um, people from Morocco and North Africa who were interacting in, uh, you know, Spain as well as uh, Sardinia. Um, you know, we see the uh, spread of megalith building cultures as well as an associated priesthood. Um, also starting, you know, about 4000 BC uh, that spreads across uh, most of Europe in the succeeding few hundred years. Uh, we do have, um, there's actually DNA from people who were buried in a megalithic 
you know, and a megalith is something like Stonehenge. They uh, really took off around 4000 BC and uh, were a major part, presumably, of the religion of the, uh, you know, EEF peoples for the next 1600 years or so. Um, there is evidence from the burials we have at some of the megalithic sites that the priests or whoever was associated with these megaliths were actually blood relations with each other. So it'd be something similar to uh, the Egyptian religion where you do have these kind of hereditary priesthoods. Um, so that was, you know, my guess is these people kind of, they were, you know, in a way trade had a, religious connotations back then as well. So you'd have these um, priests mediating a lot of the, uh, um, what do you call them, trade, you know, not just religion, but also the trade and diplomacy, um, probably foreign policy as well. You know, they were definitely not nice people, um, even though there's not as much evidence for human sacrifice in the uh, fourth millennium BC as there was in the uh, fifth millennium BC. Uh, so whatever this re religion was, it wasn't as nice, um, but there's not really anything comparable to, you know, we have at certain sites in Germany, which look like, you know, people were being mass human sacrificed um, in 4800 BC. So, uh, you know, not a nice religion, but still nicer than uh, what the early Neolithic had had. Um, and this period uh, associated with the, you know, kind of beginning of the megalithic trade, the expansion of sea trade, uh, this is called the Middle Neolithic. Um, the, you know, earlier phase before the hunter-gatherer resurgence is called the early Neolithic by uh, some people. Um, every archaeologist has their own kind of dating schema, so it's, you know, it's all relative. Um, but that's how I think of them. Um, so Rome, Italy, you know, it's not immune to these processes, has the same thing. Uh, the only unique part of it is they have that kind of 10% of ancestry um, coming from, you know, people in, you know, Iran and the Caucasus, and that's just the racially distinctive component. The people in Anatolia at the time were perhaps 40% of this kind of Caucasian hunter-gatherer or Iran, Neolithic, or Zagrosian ancestry, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, so most likely it was a substantial migration or invasion, you know, that ended up comprising perhaps a quarter to a third, you know, maybe a little bit more of, um, you know, the population of uh, Italy and Greece at the time. Um, so, you know, that's that it's, uh, you know, kind of hard to say what happens for the next uh, few hundred years. Um, there was another climactic shift about 3,600 BC. Uh, so between kind of 4,000 BC and 3,600 BC, there's actually an EEF golden age. This is the best their civilization uh, will ever get, um, you know, and things in Europe as a whole, uh, won't actually get better until 2,200 BC. So this kind of um, 4,000 to 3,600 BC golden age, you know, you see the rise of these civilizations. Um, you know, you have uh, evident stuff like the Mitchellsburg culture, the uh, RRP culture in France. Um, you have the Kukateni Trapelians in uh, Ukraine and Romania. I should say Western Ukraine and Romania. They didn't really go into Eastern Ukraine. Um, and uh, they had tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of people. There's evidence of uh, genetic homogenization. Um, one thing that shows up in DNA is if, you know, people are marrying their cousins a lot and you can tell how big their population is, or at least get a kind of a rough idea of what their breeding pool is like. Um, for hunter-gatherers, you know, it's very small. Some places like Ireland, the hunter-gatherers probably never numbered more than 10, 20,000 people. Um, you know, we see from stuff we found in uh, Germany, Italy, France, you know, these kind of middle Neolithic populations were uh, definitely pretty substantial. Um, you know, cousin marriage was very rare. Um, although there is evidence in Ireland, at least, of a uh, brother-sister or, uh, you know, father-daughter, mother-son um, relationship. So whatever, you know, this megalithic religion may have been accompanied with kind of the practice of royal incest, where they would have believed that their rulers were, you know, literally a uh, divine being, and they couldn't marry other anyone else outside of their uh, immediate family. Um, again, that's just one source, but the uh, largest megalith in all of Europe, in uh, Ireland, um, you know, it does show you know, the guy who's the best dressed and the uh, most importantly um, buried 
you know, is the product of a first degree relationship, um, incestuous marriage. And uh, there's nothing else anywhere in Europe that's like that. Um, you know, the only thing we see that is in historical Egypt with the um, sibling marriages. And uh, I believe the Zoroastrians had a similar thing, even though it wasn't as widely spread and was not in the, uh, you know, it's more of a religious kind of thing rather than a, um, you know, royal thing for the uh, Zoroastrians. Um, so on that note, you have this kind of, uh, you know, EEF society, even if it has more WHG and, um, you know, Caucasian hunter-gatherer or CHG ancestry in it. Um, so they wouldn't have been that kind of racially distinctive from their neighbors. Um, they would have had fair skin. Um, most of them would have had brown hair. Most uh, would have been, you know, kind of short still. You know, these people were probably 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five for the men, you know, probably 4'11", um, 5 feet for the women. So, you know, just not very healthy. Um, some coastal communities were probably doing better just because they could live off fish. Um, but overall, you know, it was a pretty miserable time. Um, definitely signs of a lot of endemic warfare. We have uh, forts that were discovered, um, not just in Italy, but uh, all over Europe where, um, you know, there's signs of storm, there's fires, there's tons of people, you know, skeletons lying on the ground with uh, stone arrowheads in their rib cages, which is always a sign that, you know, something bad happened. Their uh, fort was attacked and, you know, the people got shot to death with arrows or, you know, beaten to death with uh, stone axes. Um, so that's never fun. You know, basically these people, um, you know, well, there's no large scale battle sites you know, it can be assumed there were definitely, uh, you know, kind of like kings that had the resources to build these megaliths and to build these forts and command some sorts of uh, resources. Um, you know, so there were definitely battles, even if we, you know, haven't found any specific battlefields yet. Um, I'm sure they're out there. So um, what happens in 3600 BC is this golden age kind of comes to an end. Um, you have, there is a climactic shift and what it does is it makes it so that the growing um, of agricultural plants can't be done as systematically as it had been before. So uh, it shifts, a lot of these societies uh, shift from kind of purely being agricultural fishing and uh, you know, they shift over kind of to a mixed pastoralism and the populations all over Europe plunge, you know, probably to a fifth or a third of what they had been um, in that kind of 400 year, you know, 4000 BC to a 3600 BC golden age. And so they do have this dark age, um, you know, and it goes on for uh, quite some time. Uh, there is a revival between, uh, you know, about 3300 and, or, uh, yeah, about 3300 to uh, 3100. And then, you know, kind of another short revival between 3000 and um, 2900. But, uh, you know, both those revivals are kind of ephemeral. And uh, the reason the second revival was kind of ephemeral was because they were, you know, invaded. There had been a people, um, you know, the uh, Caucasian hunter-gatherers had uh, migrated up kind of at the same. So we're going to go back uh, several thousand years. We're going to go back to 6200 BC and those great cataclysms that we've been talking about earlier. Uh, you know, and one of those cataclysms involved the Caspian Sea, which was much, much larger um, than it was today. Now, after these cataclysms kind of subsided, uh, all the people who had been living in that area, who were presumably a people called the Eastern Hunter Gatherers or the EHGs, um, you know, had been probably wiped out by these floods. And the Caucasian Hunter Gatherers migrated from the Caucasus Mountain region, which is kind of Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan. Um, and they migrated up to this, uh, you know, what's modern day Astrahan in Russia. Um, which is kind of at the northern end of the Caspian Sea. And it's where the Volga River meets the Caspian Sea, and there's a large delta, and there's plenty of great fishing there. Um, so these Caucasian hunter-gatherers, they kind of set up uh, near Astrahan, um, about 6,000 B.C., possibly as early as 6,200 B.C. Um, and, you know, we've got some evidence of them uh, establishing fishing colonies. Now, the EHGs uh, had survived kind of in the northern areas, where they weren't right next to the uh, Caspian. And... Um, you know, these EHGs, they had, uh, you know, at various points, you know, they would invade the Baltic, they would invade Scandinavia, 
uh, but they never really penetrated. Um, you know, they also somewhat penetrated in Ukraine, um, but they didn't really break the wall of the uh, early European farmer or EEF societies. Um, so you have the Eastern hunter gatherers that are kind of up north um, in Kazan, you know, Moscow, that kind of area. And some of them drift south and they meet with the uh, Caucasian hunter gatherers on the Volga River. And they, um, it starts off being, you know, more kind of the mid Volga region, um, you know, think kind of Samara, Saratov, um, that area ends up being, you know, more uh, Eastern hunter gatherer heavy at first, but it kind of gradually, you know, over the course of the 4000s, um, you know, drifts into being an even mix. So about 50% CHG and 50% EHG and ancestry. And you start to have the development of these distinctive cultures. And these distinctive cultures end up being, um, you know, they uh, became in genetics are known as the step, you know, racial component or ancestry component or whatever one or step population, whatever you want to call them. And they were uh, speakers of the Indo-European, you know, what became the Indo-European languages. Uh, the Indo-European languages, they're incredibly widespread. Uh, we're speaking in one right now, English, uh, Russian, German, uh, Spanish, Italian, Hindi, Punjabi, Farsi, Kurdish. Uh, they're all Indo-European languages. Um, the only non-Indo-European languages are Basque, uh, Estonian, Finnish, Hungarian, and Maltese, as well as Turkish. Um, Basque is the language of either one of the uh, Western hunter-gatherer groups who took over an EEF society in 4400 BC, or it is an EEF language itself. It's currently unknown uh, what it is, but it's not related to anything else. Uh, Hungarian, Finnish, and Estonian uh, came to Europe uh, much later, probably about 1500 to 1200, uh, or maybe even as late as 800 BC. Um, so they arrived significantly after the Indo-Europeans. Uh, that's topic for another discussion. Uh, so the Indo-Europeans, they go and they form, and, you know, they're largely formed by 4000 BC. Um, and, uh, you know, they're very primitive people. They live in a very marginal environment. They, um, and, you know, for them, they actually do have some luck. So they do, it looks like they're among the first either inventors or, um, you know, adopters of the wagon, you know, they uh, have access to horses, so they have carts. Um, and, you know, this enables them to transport their stuff a lot further than anyone else can. Uh, that's a huge advantage in trade. It's a huge advantage in warfare. They didn't have chariots at that point. Those would, uh, you know, come significantly later. Um, but they did go and they had bronze. And, the bronze is actually, um, it's difficult to make because the resources you need for it, uh, tin and copper, are you know, difficult to both get. Uh, you know, a lot of times you get one or the other. Now, the Indo-Europeans were fortunate enough to be close to the southern Urals, where there actually happens to be a huge copper mine. So uh, right around 3000 BC, the uh, Indo-Europeans stumbled upon this or, you know, found out about it and they massively exploit it. It becomes, you know, I think it's the largest uh, mine of its type in that, you know, kind of era. And they're mining all this copper, all this copper, and it's enough to outfit a very substantial army. Um, you know, as you can imagine, being able to arm your guys, you know, even in copper and especially in bronze, uh, whether it's with armor, whether it's with, um, you know, axes are one thing they were really famous for. They loved their bronze boat head axes. Um, you know, they used all this metal and they conquered all of their neighbors. They wanted to leave the steppe. And um, it was pretty much, you know, straight Mongol type, you know, worse than the Mongols, actually. It's like Comanche tier. Uh, they just totally depopulated, um, you know, most of Eastern Europe, as well as Germany, you know, Poland, Scandinavia, the Baltic, Finland. Um, you know, they just wiped tons and tons of people out. Um, and they were just totally primitive savages. They were definitely Comanche tier. They had no written language. Um, you know, their EEF neighbors at the time were considerably more advanced. The uh, Kukuteni Trapelians of uh, Ukraine and Romania actually had kind of a written proto language. Um, 
you know, kind of similar to the early, you know, glyphs we see before Egyptian hieroglyphics. Um, that, you know, the EEFs also had like electroplating. They could, you know, put gold, um, you know, on top of metals. They, you know, had crude batteries even, uh, you know, that they used for electroplating. Um, the Indo Europeans did have, you know, fairly, very good metallurgy. Um, you know, they appear to have kind of organized stuff in wolf brotherhoods, you know, where they would go and, uh, you know, or dog brotherhoods, they would kill their own dogs um, as part of their initiation into these uh, kind of male, you know, warrior societies. Um, they had s some tropes that we know, you know, we can see in Roman, Greek, um, and Norse mythology, as well as Hinduism. Uh, there's stuff like the divine twins, there's the thunder god, um, you know, stuff like that. And, uh, you know, that's kind of a topic for another day. So they go in, and between 3000 and 2800, probably right around 2900 BC, the Indo-Europeans go and they destroy all the civilizations of uh, Eastern and Central Europe. And the early European uh, farmers, the EEFs, kind of hold out beyond the Rhine and the Danube. Um, and, uh, you know, they go and they hold out for the next three to four hundred years. So uh, there's actually depopulated regions, um, you know, in areas like southern Czechia where the EEFs and the Indo-Europeans boarded each other. And there was just, you know, there's no sign of anything going on in archaeology other than that the forests grow a lot. Um, you know, it's definitely a very, very hostile relationship um, in most areas. You know, there were exceptions like Denmark. Um, but it was very much the Indo-Europeans converted what used to be an agricultural and a, I, I should really say agro-pastoral because it was kind of a mix. The EFs by that point had a mix of uh, farming as well as uh, cattle ranching. Um, the Indo-Europeans shifted it pretty much into straight pastoralism. Uh, they didn't have any permanent settlements at the time. They were, you know, most we find from them is temporary camps. And, um, you know, there were... Definitely, uh, you know, very feared and destructive for good reason. Um, so what happens is uh, there is this kind of, you know, Cold War. It, I mean, it wasn't really a Cold War in the sense that I'm sure they were killing each other and there's plenty of raiding. Um, you know, between 2800 and 2400 BC, this 400 year period. Towards the end of this period, uh, there is kind of um, an increase in the amount of Eastern European farmer ancestry in the Indo-Europeans. Uh, there had been some branches like in Denmark, which had married the uh, local EEF girls, um, you know, pretty quickly. In a lot of areas, it took more time for them to be assimilated in the societies. Um, you know, so it's definitely, you know, the Indo-Europeans marrying EEF women, not, you know, kind of an exchange, not a true... You know, and a lot of these were probably be, being taken on uh, slave raids, that sort of thing. You know, I I always think of the Comanches being, uh, you know, what they did in the American Southwest, as well as kind of the uh, Mexican North um, as the best equivalent for what the Indo-Europeans in this period were like. Um, so towards the end of this period, we have, um, you know, you do have the expansion of what's called the bell beaker culture, and it actually expands out of Spain. And uh, the bell beakers, they go and they uh, have fairly advanced trading knowledge. They go and they spread technologies as well as presumably the religion as well. Um, to, uh, you know, the Indo-Europeans, you start to see the Indo-Europeans adopting megalithic burials. Um, there's some evidence they might have started doing that earlier. Uh, but it really, really takes off after the uh, spread of the bell beaker culture. And uh, the bell beaker culture is a genuine example of pots, not people. Um, you know, there were multiple groups, uh, you know, very racially distinctive groups that had, you know, that used the, uh, you know, kind of bell beaker toolkit. And this uh, spread of the bell beaker culture, you know, uh, in addition to having kind of that spread of more EEF ancestry into the Indo-Europeans. You also see the Indo-Europeans uh, go back to what the EEFs before them had for their mode of production, kind of a mixed agro-pastoralism, uh, where they readopted farming. Um, you know, there's evidence of return to slash and burn farming in a lot of areas where they would go, you know, kind of like light a forest on fire and then, uh, you know, use the, um, you know, resultant charcoal and all that to, uh, you know, have a fertile field that you can grow crops on. Um, so as a result, there's kind of an Indo-European population boom. 
And uh, most importantly, at least for Britain and for the Mediterranean, is you see the Indo-Europeans adopt the most advanced ships uh, that had yet been seen in that part of the world. Now, uh, the, what we, the evidence we have from recorded societies like uh, ancient Rome, for example, is that they would get a third of their revenue, you know, the Romans specifically got a third of their revenue from the sea trade, um, you know, mostly with India, also with some uh, other states as well. Um, you know, and that's a tremendous amount. I mean, when you lose a third of your revenue, you would, uh, you know, not be able to pay your soldiers, you couldn't pay your retainers, you know, you'd have civil war, mutinies, you know, um, all sorts of stuff. You wouldn't be able to pay off your uh, puppets that, you know, you pay to keep order, your bureaucracy collapses, all of that. Um, the adoption of these ships by the Indo-Europeans probably caused a similar issue with these EEF states. You know, they presumably were more robust than the Roman Empire since they were much more smaller scale and probably not as reliant on trade, but it definitely would have dealt a heavy blow to them, um, especially in eliminating the metals that they uh, would have needed to, uh, you know, for pretty much everything. Um, so the Indo-Europeans go and they launch a second round of conquests about 2400 BC. Uh, they totally, basically completely exterminate the population of Britain um, kill about half the population of France, um, about, you know, quite a bit, you know, maybe a fifth of the uh, population of Spain. Um, there's evidence of all sorts of uh, fortification crazes going on in Iberia that are abruptly snuffed out as soon as the, uh, you know, right as the Indo-Europeans arrive and, uh, you know, end as soon as the Indo-Europeans finish their conquests. Um, so very bad time for the uh, early European farmers. They just could not stand up against these, uh, you know, pirate raiders from the uh, north. Um, the first sites we do see, at least in France, for the Indo-Europeans are coastal settlements. Uh, so, you know, that kind of ran, you know, it does support the theory that the uh, Indo-Europeans in that kind of period around 2400 BC had shifted from being, you know, cart riding, um, you know, mounted infantrymen that, you know, would murder everyone they came across into roving sea pirates that wanted to take over the sea trade um, and kind of dominate stuff. Uh, the invasions probably weren't as bloody as the genetics suggest. Um, you know, about half the uh, modern French population, for instance, descends from, a, you know, half their ancestry descends from the Indo-Europeans compared to about a fifth of the uh, modern Spanish ancestry. Um, most likely what happens is the Indo-Europeans, you know, they did come in as quite a large group, uh, but they were just more reproductively successful. They had access to better pasture lands, better ports, you know, better fishing spots. And that made it so they would have more kids than, uh, you know, the poor EEFs who would have been, you know, kind of peons forced into uh, more and more marginal lands. Um, it's possible that some of the megalithic, you know, kind of that blood-defined megalithic priestly caste uh, that we discussed earlier, uh, would have survived, uh, particularly in Scandinavia. We see a uh, haplogroup I, which um, you know is associated with the uh, Western hunter-gatherers, who had you know kind of taken over the EF society in that region, um, which is actually the most common Y chromosomal haplogroup uh, within kind of um, you know some parts of Scandinavia. Uh, so there is, you know, there are some EEFs that do go and ally themselves with the new Indo-European order, and do quite well actually. Um, you know, in Scandinavia seems to be the clearest case of that, uh, elsewhere it's more difficult to tell. Um, Italy was conquered in, a, you know, this kind of second series of conquests. It probably was invaded by land from uh, Hungary. There's, um, you know, much as similar conquerors would come into Italy uh, via Hungary in the future as well, you know, like the Lombards, um, you know, various Germanic invaders. Um, and, uh, they were pretty similar to what they did in France. They replaced about half the, uh, you know, EEFs in, um, you know, at least kind of the Italian peninsula part. Sicily was a little bit different. The Iberian, you know, kind of Spanish Portuguese branch of the EEFs, uh, had a more, you know, was more navally based and they were the ones that ended up taking, uh, Sicily, as well as Sardinia and um, the Balearic Islands uh, from the, uh, you know, the, the, their predecessors there. I mean, actually, the uh, Balearic Islands weren't actually settled until the Indo-Europeans arrived. 
Um, the Indo-Europeans arrived in that kind of 2400 to 2200 BC, on uh, you know wave of their expansion. And at that point, you actually had unmixed. We've, there's findings of uh, unadmixed um, EEFs there that hadn't mixed in with the Indo-Europeans. Um, and at the same time, you have kind of contemporary burials for Indo-Europeans, where maybe you know 40% Indo-European in ancestry. Um, you know, because they've been kind of diluted with a little bit with the uh, EEF ancestry by that point. Um, you know, rather than later, we'd kind of settle more down to the Iberian percentage or where it would be, um, you know, about 20 percent uh, Indo-European in ancestry and the remainder being kind of the EEF and uh, WHGs that they had uh, picked up along the way. Um, so with that, you have presumably the Italic languages. Uh, Italic is a branch of Indo-European that had uh, settled in um, Italy at that time. There's no specific findings from that uh, particular period, um, you know, the early mid bronze or I should say the Mid-Bronze Age uh, within Italy, outside of Sicily, I should say, um, you know, from when the Indo-Europeans were doing their initial conquests. All of this stuff is from the uh, kind of early and uh, pre-Roman or pre-Roman like kingdom and republic era. Um, but, you know, we know from archaeology that, you know, the Indo-Europeans and various uh, cultural things we see from them uh, do appear, you know, right around the same time that they're conquering the rest of Europe in this uh, second wave of invasions from uh, 2400 to 2200 BC. Um, so this does appear to, uh, you know, it's definitely the period we have from 2200 BC till the rise of the uh, Roman kingdom and the 700 BC you know, that's, uh, you know, we've got a 1500 year time span, um, which is fairly dark. We do know that um, the Minoans or people related to the Minoans uh, that do carry that kind of distinctive like Iran, Neolithic, uh, Caucasian hunter-gatherer ancestry, um, you know, they do go and launch an expansion that affects parts of southern Italy, um, as well as Sardinia and Sicily. So there was definitely like clearly some sort of naval warfare uh, going on between these, between these maritime states. Um, you know, probably more chieftain level than a uh, kingdom level, although it's possible there were kingdoms as well. Um, you know, we do, do see contacts uh, with North Africa as well. Um, you know, as they're all kind of interlocked within, you know, there's like a Met West Mediterranean, um, you know, trade. And then there's also like an East Mediterranean trade as well. And uh, so you have kind of the Minoans, the Indo-Europeans, and whoever these uh, mysterious North African peoples are, they're all interacting with each other. So the next uh, really huge kind of cataclysmic event is the Bronze Age collapse of 1200 BC. Um, basically, civilization everywhere falls. Um, you have the Sea Peoples. So, you know, I mentioned there were kind of, um, you know, you probably had these, like what we see in classical Greece, where at the time of the Peloponnesian War, you have the, um, you know, the Delian League with Athens, the Peloponnesian League led by Sparta. And part of it was just our you know, ideology. You had the uh, Spartans were organized by oligarchy. You had the Athenians um, organized by democracy. But within their blocks, there were definitely very clear, uh, as Th Thucydides discusses in uh, his book, The Peloponnesian War, uh, ethnic links between a lot of these uh, cities, which informed their loyalties and their membership in uh, these various leagues. Um, it's probably something similar in the uh, mid to late Bronze Age. Um, you know, we, we'll have like Minoan and Indo-European sites like on Sicily, for example, that would have been, you know, only a couple dozen miles apart from each other. Um, and there were presumably different colonies of those, you know, city-state leagues. And um, the Sea Peoples were likely, you know, recruited as part of those leagues. They would have, um, you know, much like the Italian medieval city-states, Venice, Genoa, they would have spent a lot of their time and money and resources and investing in uh, naval development, naval warfare, uh, just shipbuilding, you know, as opposed to the more land-based powers. Um, you know, and all these guys got together at the time of the Bronze Age collapse, which was a, uh, according to Eric Klein in his excellent 1177 BC, the uh, year civilization collapsed, um, you had this giant kind of cataclysmic East Mediterranean world war going on, where, like the Mycenaeans, the Hittites, the Egyptians, you know, the Elamites and everyone um, were all intriguing and warring with each other. And kind of the remnant of that and, uh, you know, historical memory is the uh, Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, 
you know, whereas we do have kind of the ruins of Troy have been uncovered and it looks like they were destroyed you know, right around this time that all these other civilizations in uh, the Middle East and Britain and, um, you know, Southern Russia, uh, also, you know, Poland, all kind of disintegrate right at the same time. Um, so the trade really was a big deal, um, you know, at that time and Britain in particular, you know, basically disintegrated and its population was much, much less, you know, perhaps a fifth of uh, what it had been, um, you know, at its peak in kind of the Middle Bronze Age. Um, the Bronze Age, you know, despite all the stuff I'm talking about for like, you know, just mass destruction or whatever, um, you know, and population replacements, it was, you know, due to, you know, the spread of bronze tools um, better than the Neolithic in the sense that, you know, like if you have a bronze axe, it helps you, you know, you can cut down trees earlier, um, easier, you know, there's all sorts of like farming tools and uh, cosmetics, you know, that sort of stuff, um, you know, better trade that, uh, than you had in the Neolithic, um, you know, on the other side, there were, you know, male war bands that were roving around and killing everyone. So that wouldn't have been much fun to uh, live under either, but, you know, I think it was an improvement from kind of the Neolithic, especially the early Neolithic and like the human sacrifice and stuff. Um, you know, there's not, there's some evidence for human sacrifice, but it's definitely not as tech tier like it was in the early Neolithic. Um, from what we see in the Y chromosomes, there's stuff called star-shaped phylogenies, which is just a fancy way of saying that you would have like a guy, a king, a warlord, you know, a chief, whatever. Um, you know, his descendants, you know, would be organized in kind of these blood priesthoods or in these you know, like male warrior bands, and they would only kind of give uh, positions to other guys in their war band who are all related to each other in the male line. Um, so you do have these certain male lineages, like R1B, R1A, I in Scandinavia, uh, that go and like take over. And you can very clearly see that, you know, just huge numbers of people in uh, Europe today and you know, all over the world uh, are direct male line descendants of like a handful of guys who lived in the early and mid-Bronze Age. Um, I mean, there's cases of this later, like Neil of Nine Host, the most uh, famous medieval examples. Um, but the Bronze Age, it was definitely like a common thing. It wasn't, um, you know, that it wasn't as uncommon as it was in the uh, Iron and uh, Middle Ages. Um, so, you know, that's that for the uh, Bronze Age. Um, 1200 BC, everything collapses, you know, civilization regresses. Uh, you know, people who had writing forget how to use it. You know, things are terrible. Um, you know, the states or confederations that did exist collapsed into, um, you know, kind of smaller warring chiefdoms, that kind of thing. Uh, there is evidence of a, uh, you know, some Uralic, you know, like Estonian, Finnish, Udmurt, Mari um, confederations in Russia, but I won't go into that. That's for another talk. Um so you kind of, you know, civilization reemerges 800 BC and you have iron. Now iron, it's in a sense, it's kind of hard, hard, harder to make than bronze since it requires higher temperatures to melt it and reforge it and stuff. But iron's a lot more widespread. So, uh, you know, more people can use it and you're not as reliant on, you know, say a distant trade route to the tin mines of England. You know, if you're an Italian, it's easier to just get the uh, local iron that you have in Italy. Um, and that's where, you know, we start off our uh, story with the Romans, the rise of the Roman Republic. Um, so the Romans go and, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, so the Romans basically, you know, they're kind of the mix of, um, you know, they've got the Indo-European ancestry, you know, maybe 40% or so, you know, and the rest is the mix of the, you know, other components from the, you know, various Mediterranean civilizations. Um and you have that kind of continue through from the kingdom period through the republic period. And the republic period um, towards the end is where you start to see the changes. Um, and this is where we go into recorded history as well. So the Roman Republic in the beginning, it was a republic. You had, a, you know, the base of the society was kind of the middle classes, the yeoman farmer, you know, the local guy who owned the pottery shop, that kind of thing. Um, you know, you didn't have... I mean, you had economies of scale, I'm sure, but it wasn't on the level of, you know, what, we, what you would see in the late Republic and the Roman Empire. Um, you know, you had slavery, but it wasn't, you know, that widespread at that point yet. 
you know, in the, at least compared to, uh, you know, the late Republic and the uh, Empire. Um, so the Romans go and they have the, the uh, you know, these yeoman farmers that form the bulk of their society. They're very, you know, just like uh, their class throughout all of history. They're very staunch patriots. They're willing to go and fight for their country. Um, you know, when you have Hannibal who goes out and wipes all these legions out um, in the Second Punic War, you know, the Romans, do they, you know, call it quits like, you know, a warlord who was commanding mercenaries would? No, you know, the, they knew that their human farmers would support them no matter what. They didn't have to worry about a, uh, you know, rebellion of mercenaries like the Carthaginians did. Um, you know, they were their own fellow Romans. They'd set them up with colonies and they'd reward them with, uh, you know, land grants when they won. You know, every Roman you know, was loyal. And it's actually kind of surprising, uh, you know, how loyal they did stay. It was only the uh, Greek city states, the South that went and, uh, you know, kind of rebelled against the, you know, allied with um, Hannibal at various points, but, you know, pretty much all the other Roman uh, cities and towns and colonias, I think they called them, uh, you know, stayed true to uh, Rome. And so uh, the Romans, rather than just giving up to Hannibal, in spite of everything they'd suffered, decided to outlaw the, you know, the word peace and continue the war. <laughs> and of course, they go and they win the Second Punic War and, and the Third Punic War. They finish Carthage off for good. Um, so interestingly, Carthage, um, they were a Punic settlement, um, and the Punics came. You know, they were a branch of the uh, Venetians who had set up trading colonies. Um, you know, all over the Mediterranean, including in North Africa, with Carthage being the largest and most successful one of their settlements. Um, you know, there's evidence that the Phoenicians, you know, had um, fairly extensive colonies in the Balearics. They definitely mixed in with the peoples of Sardinia. Um, it even looks like they had a, uh, you know, small colony south of Rome at one point, um, as well as in kind of northeastern Italy as well. Um, there is evidence and the, uh, going back a little bit further to the very early days of Rome, um, in the Aeneid, there's the legend that the uh, Romans, and, you know, in part trace their descendants from Aeneas, a Trojan prince, you know, who goes to, you know, on all sorts of crazy adventures and ends up settling in Italy. Uh, there actually is, um, well, it's difficult to, to, of course, separate out the truth from the myth. Uh, there is evidence of um, settlement from Anatolia into um Italy around, you know, in that kind of Bronze Age collapse period of 1200 BC to uh, 800 BC, um, you know, and it appears to be, you know, most closely related to uh, the Etruscans. Um, so it is possible, you know, the, the Etruscan language is not an Indo-European language, so it is possible they came from migrants from Anatolia in the uh, Bronze Age collapse. Um, and so they would have spoken a different language from whatever the EF spoke, you know, it would have been you know, something perhaps related to uh, the Haddock languages, um, which in turn, you know, might be related to Chechen or something. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thought, thinking of uh, people related to the Chechens that were bordering the Romans. Kind of gives you an idea for, you know, just how fierce the Romans actually were as well. Um, as the Republic continues, you go and you have uh, kind of widespread immiseration amongst these yeoman farmers that provided the social basis for the Roman Republic. The Romans are they don't have kind of the bureaucracy that the um, kind of Eastern kingdoms did. They relied a lot on outsourcing, um, you know, the administration, their various conquered territories to government contractors. And these government contractors, they, you know, pooled together huge amounts of money to uh, buy the rights to administer these areas. And they, you know, in some examples, they'd basically just run them like plantations, uh, you know, presumably was not fun to live under those, they also, you know, just in the wars that Rome fought, they brought over tremendous numbers of slaves. Um, and these slaves, you would, they would be formed up in these enormous uh, farms called latifundias. You know, it's similar to what we have uh, here in California, um, you know, in the uh, Central Valley, as well as in the Imperial Valley, where we just have huge, huge numbers of, uh, you know, people living under poor conditions and just farming and growing these crops. Um, and it's far, far more efficient than anything you know, like a yeoman farmer and his family could do. So, uh, you know, the Romans, by their successes, they're undermining the social basis for the Republic, you know, over the course of the second century BC, you know, the 100s. And there are people who see this, like the Gracchi brothers, um, you know, like some of the Romans commented, you'd go out to parts of Italy and you wouldn't see any, 
you know, Roman farmers at all. You just see, you know, all these slaves from, um, you know, the Balkans, North Africa and the uh, Middle East, you know, just kind of toiling in these chain gangs on these giant plantations. And uh, that's reflected um, in genetics as well. You start to see uh, especially a large amount of um, people from the Middle East and Levant that are uh, settling in Rome uh, towards the end of the late Republic. Um, eventually, you have, uh, towards the end of the second uh, century BC, you have Gaius Marius, um, who goes and opens up the legions to everyone. You know, it's no longer these yeoman farmers who are volunteering to join the legions. You know, it's guys who are there to be professionals. And, um, you know, once you have that, you know, they start becoming loyal to the more generals. You have, you know, Caesar in the end. And uh, Caesar, you know, he's a huge figure, um, you know, not just in Roman politics, but in genetics as well. He goes and he starts bringing in Gaulish senators. Um, he brings Egypt in, or, you know, I should say successors bring uh, Egypt into the empire. And Egypt is run as a plantation. It counted for something like a quarter of all Roman state revenues, um, you know, in the second, I believe in the second century AD. So, uh, you know, very cruelly run area, but it was very, very profitable for uh, the empire. And one of the reasons it was able to finance so much stuff, um, you know, they could grow cash crops or whatever else uh, within the very fertile um, Nile Delta and had all sorts of canals and stuff to make sure it's a very agriculturally productive region. Um, so over the course of the empire, and that's when we actually have the most DNA samples from, uh, there's a very massive shift uh, towards the Middle East. You have all of these uh, people, the Middle East back then had far more people than, you know, Gaul and Spain and, um, you know, kind of the Western Empire. Uh, so you have all of these uh, people who are migrating to Italy and they're taking over the uh, cities. Um, and a lot of them, cities back in that age where populations sink both due to cost, um, diseases spread far more easily than they would in the country. And, uh, you know, you had this very, you know, Middle Eastern population that ended up uh, forming the Roman population, you know, in the imperial period. Now, uh, and this is, and there's also like evidence of, uh, you know, widespread homogenization too. You'd have people, you know, who would have like a Thracian grandmother, a Gallic grandfather, you know, a, uh, you know, a Jewish grandfather and a, you know, Syrian grandmother. Um, it's just very mixed and, uh, it does look like that was limited to urban areas. The rural people of the time did remain, um, you know, they, they did not not mix, but they uh, did kind of keep their language, their culture, um, you know, kind of a distinctive identity in a lot of areas. Um, you have like the uh, Bretons, for instance, in uh, Northwestern France who keep speaking, you know, the Celtic languages, you have the Basques of, um, you know, kind of northern Spain, southwestern France, who uh, keep speaking their language. Uh, the Albanians survived um, speaking their, you know, Bal uh, Balkans language, um, you know, even though a lot of people uh, ended up speaking Latin. So that's why um, you'll see stuff like people point out, hey, there's Africans and, you know, and really it's North Africans in uh, London. You'll see like Syrians buried in France, um, you know, Germans buried in North Africa, um, you know, the cities were definitely very, very cosmopolitan and increasingly dominated by this Middle Eastern element. Um, so a lot of the stuff they say about, oh, you know, there were like Middle Easterners or whatever in London before the uh, Anglo-Saxons Saxons arrived. Those are actually true. Um, now, the thing that happened, though, was uh, the rural areas were constantly replenishing the cities because they were a lot more healthier. You know, if you yeoman farmer, especially in a more remote province of the empire, uh, you don't have as much, you know, competition from, uh, you know, those giant latifundia farms that, you know, say a yeoman in Italy would have, um, you know, so that guy would be able to have a bunch of kids and, you know, you'd have a bunch of, you know, galls still milling around hundreds of years later. Um, you do see there are, you know, there was uh were kind of large-scale factories um you know there's been like millions of amphoras kind of liquid carrying container uh found all over the world you know they were probably uh you know there were factories where they could make tens of thousands of those things more a year um 
And those kind of large scale enterprises did go and kind of wreck the middle class in a lot of areas, presumably. Um, and the sea trade of Rome, you know, the Romans wiped out the pirates in a lot of areas, so they made it so it was uh, they had robust for their time, uh, supply lines. You know, there was trade. You could uh, bring, like, grain from one part of the empire to the other, um, you know, and feed starving areas. You had, you know, areas like Rome and Greece, which could not feed themselves. Like Greece, for instance, had to constantly import grain from Crimea and from uh, southern Ukraine you know, which is still a massive grain producing area today. You had uh, Rome, you know, with all the uh, North African um, grain imports as well. So it was very, very reliant on those. And it, while a, uh, you know, efficient system, it was not robust and it was very vulnerable to shocks. So once you start seeing things like the crisis of the third century and uh, especially the barbarian invasions of the uh, fifth century, you know, the Roman population in most areas does collapse and collapses massively. Um, you start to see that these, you know, those giant latifundias, um, you know, they cease to be. You have, you know, the slaves who are all diverse. They're not going to, you know, work for a guy who's some random Middle Easterner speaking Latin. Um, you know, there wasn't really kind of a Roman spirit that bound those people. Um, so you start started having kind of like warlords, banditry that kind of thing, as well as population collapse. Um, you see, you know, like amphoras uh, start to be, you know, more um, localized in design, and they're not mass produced as much as they were. But the uh, really big collapse, you know, once the, um, you know, especially in the fifth century with all the Huns and Goths and Vandals and everyone else, um, that's when the empire really, really collapses badly, even worse than the third century. The population probably fell to a third, maybe less, um, overall of what it was, at least in the Western states. Um, you know, uh, some areas appear to have done very well, like Brittany. Uh, you know, that's the area the Celtic people held out, kind of northwestern France. Once they were removed from all those pesky Roman taxes, they actually did quite well. Their uh, kind of localized economy in a remote area gave them a big boon because they weren't reliant on imports and exports the way that other parts of the empire were. Whereas Rome went from a city of being maybe, you know, a million people to a city of 20,000, um, you know, in the course of a century. So it was very, very bad for the residents of Rome. And there's actually a genetic shift that was accompanied with that. So with all the, uh, you know, diverse and uh, heavily, you know, Middle Eastern um, admixed populations of the cities dying off, you have these kind of rural farmers from, you know, remote areas that uh, had more kind of robust modes of production uh, recolonizing them. And these people were more... Uh, similar, the people who resettled uh, the, you know, Rome um, in the next couple of centuries were more like the um, original uh, Romans of the Republican time than they were the Romans of the late Republic or the uh, Empire. So it's kind of, you know, a full circle where, you know, the Empire's genetic legacy uh, didn't really survive. The people in most areas that uh, were there in 800, were the same that had been there, you know, a thousand years before, uh, prior to the, uh, you know, empire spreading everyone around. Um, and then once you have the Middle Ages happen, you have, you know, an influx of uh, ancestry from Northern Europe, from Germany, from Scandinavia in particular, um, you know, do the Goths and the Lombards that makes the uh, Italians uh, be, you know, relatively even more into European ancestry than they had been in the early Republican period. Um, so that was the, uh, that's the Italians today. So, um, you know, it's, uh, I think we see similar things in, um, other parts of the world as well, you know, just with cities being population sinks from disease and replenished by the, uh, you know, more robust, you know, peoples of the countryside. And that's, um. You know, I hope you guys enjoyed the uh, one-hour lecture on history of Rome. I will now open it up for questions. I think you just have to submit a request, and then I can approve you for your question. Um, you know, just make it quick. Uh, you know, don't ramble or anything, and we'll go from there. Okay, Kamichia, you can now speak. 
Thanks. What I'm actually wondering about is sort of the expansion of the Etruscans. Because if you look at, say, an ethno-linguistic map of ancient Italy, you'd know that very early on, the Etruscans actually cut the Italians, the Italic-speaking peoples off from the Po Valley. So why do you think that happened? So were they originally there before then, and the Italians came in through some other, like the Italic speakers came into another route? Or did they later expand after being pushed out into that region? I think the Italics came over in the uh, first migration, or the, I'm sorry, the second wave of Indo-Europeans of uh, 2400 to 2200 BC. And the Etruscans came, uh, you know, a thousand years or maybe a little more um, afterwards and kind of cut them off, you know, not just in the uh, Etruscan area of Etruria, um, but, you know, also possibly the, uh, you know, Turhenian peoples who, you know, appear to also share this kind of Caucasian hunter-gatherer ancestry. Um, you know, and they kind of took over that kind of northeastern part of Italy as well. So I think uh, the Italics were there first, and then the, uh, you know, Anatolian, um, you know, Etruscan-like peoples came later. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Current American resident, you should be good to speak now. A current American citizen, are you there? All right, I'm going to move on to uh, Elder Futhark. One second. Okay, Elder Futhark, you should be good to ask your question now. Elder Futhark, you there? Yeah, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, sorry about that, still had on mute. Um, my question specifically in regards to the EEFs, I've always just kind of been curious as far as like the rest of the Mediterranean basin, like um, during the Neolithic, what the people of like North Africa and the Levant, were they similar to the EEFs? And the reason why I've always thought that is because from what I understand, the EEFs, they had, you know, there's the G2A, but they also had helper groups like the E1B1B and the J1, J2. It seems like they've have diverse origins. So I've always kind of been curious about the rest of the Mediterranean basin and how that's influenced uh, Neolithic Europe as they moved in. Was it all through Anatolia or just one group or what the situation was? Yeah. I mean, there was some, you know, migration from North Africa and it, it looks like it was pretty ephemeral. Um, you know, like I mentioned, we have those North African, guys or like half North African guys that we found in like uh, Italy and then uh, Sardinia and stuff in Spain. Um, they don't seem to have really made much of a genetic impression though. They're just weirdly overrepresented in the uh, skeletons that have been DNA tested. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, kind of North Africans were part of a cosmopolitan like sea trading population. And, you know, like kind of like Rome, I think in the Neolithic, we have that same thing where the, uh, you know, cosmopolitan populations, the cities die off from diseases and, you know, just like living in the cities being expensive, uh, you know, whereas like the rural denizens keep on repopulating the cities. Um, you know, for the genetics in North Africa itself, it's, uh, you know, before the Middle Ages, it was kind of an even mix between uh, people called the Ibero Mirajans, um, you know, who are their own, their own thing. And then a, uh, you know, population that's uh, related to the EFs called the Natufians. And Natufians actually contribute a lot of ancestry to the uh, EEFs. Yeah. And so that's kind of like why there's a, you know, I think the Natufians are what we think of as being like Caucasoid, you know, for skeletons and stuff. You know, that's the, the people that have the Natufian ancestry, you know, do look that way because of the Natufian ancestry, I think. And the Natufians, they were originally from, like, modern Syria, that region, right? Yeah, like Syria, Lebanon, Israel, yeah. that kind of thing. Okay, cool. And then the, um, like, the J2s, that looks like it was specifically associated with the, uh, 
you know, kind of like Zagrosian, Iran Neolithic people. Um, you know, that's kind of their Y haplo group. Gotcha. The E one B one B one. Um, I'm not sure. It's. I mean, I think a lot of the key to that is Egypt, and you know, I'm just waiting for the uh, ancient Egypt DNA paper to come out, and uh, hopefully that will help us make more sense of, you know, what was going on in the Middle East at the time. Very interesting. I appreciate it. All right, I'm going to go on to Nicodemus real quick. All right, Nicodemus, you should be able to speak. Can, can hear you great. Um, sorry, I joined in late. I'm not sure what the parameters for this conversation are. Are we talking like the ancient Romans, like Republican era or before? Oh, yeah. We went over, uh, you know, Rome from uh, 270,000 B.C. to uh, the Middle Ages. Okay. So, um, I know that the Sardinians are pretty isolated yeah, genetically speaking and even linguistically like supposedly I've heard that their uh, dialect of Italian is the closest thing to a vulgar Latin that there is and so what is the relationship of the Sardinians in the greater like Italian peninsula and like you know are they basically the closest thing in modern day Romans or what? No, um, they're actually the closest to the uh, original kind of cardioware EEFs. They're like 80% of the uh, cardioware EEF industry. They, uh, you know, the Sardinians, um, the coastal areas were a lot more vulnerable to malaria. Um, so, you know, the coastal peoples kind of died off. Whereas, uh, you know, the interior people who are closely related to the uh, original EEFs have kind of repopulated the coast repeatedly. So they're... Uh, you know, very, very old holdout of the EEFs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're pretty distinctive from the uh, other Italians. And um, so linguistically, I've heard that they are quite similar. Their language or dialect is quite similar to vulgar Latin. Is that true? Do you know anything about that? I'm not familiar with it, but it wouldn't surprise me, uh, given, you know, it's a very isolated area. And okay, so and start and all about the uh, early Indo your uh, early European farmers. Um, aren't this are Sardinians the like closest to the early European farmers? I know I've read something about them. Yes, their genetic background being like the closest to them. Yes, that's correct. All right. Also, just before I'm done, because. Only thing I can think of off the top of my mind is the Sardinians. How closely related are they to the Corsicans? I don't know. I'd have to look up the uh, Corsican DNA results. All right. Um, that's about all I had right now. All right now. Move theory there. I guess he's not. I'm going to um, approve Bondio. Okay, Bondiola, you should be able to speak now. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Hey, yes, I can hear you. Uh, what question do you have, Bandiola? Um So my question is, uh, today, right, in 2021, which uh, ethnic groups or which countries are genetically speaking the closest to Republican Romans? Italians. So, but like Italians from a specific region or just Italians in general? Um, probably nor Northern Italians would be the closest and Sicilians and S S S um, the Sardinians would be the least closest related to the uh, classical Romans. And uh, did like the, <clears throat> how is this? 
the Republican Romans have any genetic effect on any of the regions that they ruled? It doesn't really look like it. Um, the city populations died off pretty much everywhere. Um, so, you know, the places the Romans spread didn't, you know, they didn't leave too much of an impact genetically, even if they left a lot of uh, archaeological accomplishments. Okay, thank you. That that were my, my questions. All right, I'm going to approve Oleg now. Oleg, you should be able to ask your question. Oleg, are you there? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I had a question about uh, if there have a if um, there have ever been DNA studies specifically done on um, Christian cemeteries and like catacombs in uh, like Imperial Rome, because something that always has kind of struck in me was the fact that uh, the book of Roman, um, the, the epistle to the Romans and, you know, some other uh, Roman texts like uh, the epistle of Barnabas have been written in Greek, despite the fact that the uh, inhabitants, you know, th these were being written by uh, people in Rome. So have there been any uh, uh, s genetic studies on specifically like Christian grave sites and uh, Christian, because you were talking about this like Middle Eastern urban population during the empire. And uh, yeah. Yeah, let me just uh, look through the um, paper real quick, see where they got their samples from. I'd have to read the supplement. I don't see it where I noted it. Um, I think they were just looking at what they had access to. I don't think uh, they specifically